desert trails in the glow of early morning. Desert trails all a glitter in the dawning. Watch them shine. There are diamonds in the sand all this morning. Howdy there, Daylight Burners. Happy Wednesday. How's the week? Getting one day closer to election and uh, one day closer to another cycle of impending doom and madness. Uh, But in the meantime, we got one of fan favorites, one of my favorite people, back on the show, Mr. Scott Hall, buckaroo man, if there ever was one. Um, I really, really enjoy visiting with this guy. Uh, for whatever reason, we hit it off right from the get go and, uh, we've become pretty good buddies and I like the shit out of this guy and I know you guys do too. So I won't keep you too much longer, but before we get into it, you know, I got some people that help me be able to talk to uh, folks like this and, uh, put it in your ear holes. So let me tell you about Stetson ranches up there in Fromberg, Montana, uh, right in the heart of cow calf country. Uh, awesome family. Some of the best people you ever meet in your life. They're, uh, they're running a very diversified multi-generational outfit, looking at being, becoming a legacy type ranch. And, uh, as we said, we're, they're diversified because they got to, they got to keep things going for many generations and support multiple families throughout the years. So, uh, part of that, they, uh, they've got some industrial hemp getting in on the ground floor of what is getting ready to be a booming, uh, cash crop type market. Um, they got some of the best quarter horses that money can buy. We're talking, uh, old school foundation quarter horse, uh, bloodlines all on the papers of these blood mares and they're bred back to some really, really nice studs. Spitting out some some really athletic, uh, you know, heavy boned, um, kind of soggy, just athletic, uh, level headed uh, horses, ready to go any which direction you might want, uh, performance or pleasure, ranch or rodeo, it doesn't really matter. They can do it all, and then top it off, they've got a pasture to plate, uh, beef delivered directly to your doorstep from Stetson Ranches. Uh, we got some registered Angus cows covering them with uh, registered Hereford bulls. It's uh, bringing you a F1 Black Baldy calf uh, prime every single time on the carcass. Uh, Six ninety five a pound, just a little bit more than what you'd pay for a pound of hamburger in the grocery store. You're getting your steaks, you're getting your tenderloin, you're getting your stew meat, your roast, your hamburger, all of the good stuff, all of the lower quality stuff. All in one package, uh, as, as little as an eighth of a beef at 65 pounds uh, of beef delivered to your door on dry ice. And, uh, and you know, you know, the people that's raising it, you know, the people and the care that goes into those animals. It's, uh, it's some of the best beef you can buy on this, uh, in this, in this country and uh, coming from some of the best people I personally know. Uh, StetsonRanches.com. If you want to order, you got any questions for them, you can also go follow Jesse on Facebook and Instagram, Jesse Stetson. That's Jesse with one S. Uh, tell him you heard about it all on Burning Daylight. Next up, and finally, we've got our longest running sponsor, the OG sponsor, Mr. George Raftopla is my good buddy, and Loma Livestock, the best goddamn sale barn in North America. Uh, got a sale coming to you twice a week during, during this fall run. Uh, feeders on Monday and cows and bulls and miscellaneous stuff on Fridays. Starting at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, uh, you, can, you can show up, bid right there. And if you can't, you got to feel ashamed of yourself and um, but don't, not too ashamed because you can still watch it online. Head over to dvauction.com. Click on the Loma Livestock tab and you can watch the sale live and you can bid right there as well. Uh, George is doing some really cool stuff with uh, high frequency tags and data collection, uh, helping you market your cattle, bring a little bit of value back to your bottom line. Um, 
doing everything they can to make the buyer happy and make the seller happy. Uh, being a good wingman on both ends, that's Loma Livestock. And that is why they're the best goddamn sale barn in North America. You got any questions or you want to consign with them, give them a holler, 970-858-9988. Uh, make sure you check out their website for the market report uh, on paper. Every uh, every Tuesday evening-ish, uh, we'll do a live market report with George here on Burning Daylight. Um, go follow them on Facebook and Instagram, Loma Livestock. And that's going to do it uh, for the sponsors today. Remember, uh, next week is... Uh, November starts and we're doing Small Business November. So if you'd like to be featured in, uh, and have an ad read on on the podcast here, head over to my website, burning-daylight.com. It'll be right there on the homepage. There is a form that you can fill out. And uh, just go ahead and, and fill that out if you'd like to have your business featured. Uh, doing my my little part that I can to, to help out the, the small business economy that has been just wrecked here this year. So... Um, Christmas is coming up <clears throat> and we gotta, we gotta help each other out. We don't see that enough across the country. You know, everybody's just pissed off, but, uh, give your, give your fellow Americans a helping hand, uh, support by local, by small businesses. And, um, yeah, let me help you out, uh, get some stuff sold. Let me help you guys out listening get some stuff bought for Christmas presents and, uh, and just helping out you know, average working folks to get a, get a little bit farther ahead in life. So, um, burning dash daylight.com, fill out the form and, uh, let's get back into the show. Mr. Scott, all oh, my good friends. Um, Arnold Rojas, from what I have read, probably has some of the most, from some of the largest collection of the history of the Carol lore that I've ever read. Yeah. Um, he has a book about two inches thick that you can pick up. I've been right. looking for mine lately just to remind me some of the old traditions like uh, watching your shadow when you're training a horse. Okay. Stuff like that. I, I think a lot of guys, they they look down on what they call a shadow watcher, but that was that was a real deal. You know, that was how you trained horses. You'd get I, uh, up in the morning and... I do that a lot. And I, I never thought much of it, but I, uh, I I look at my shadow a lot so I can see, like, you know, if I if I can see my, my foot come up to, to touch him in the shoulder, I know that horse can see it, too, so that not only can they... Uh, they can see the coming, you know, they can see that spur coming, and... And if they can see it, then you don't have to, you know, you're not really kicking them. You're just reaching up and, uh, and tapping, asking them to, to step. And but that, 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 that kind of helps me a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a few other things that he goes over in there that are pretty old tradition, like uh, making sure that the stars are right. You know, the moon is a certain sign to start a cult. Mm -hmm. things like that and then he goes over um where the old uh, mexicans and spanish came through into california and he goes over the zorro folklore and stuff like that um just a lot of neat things and he tells stories of all the old buckaroos that he knew and yeah he goes on, on a lot of neat stories right there that you know it, it's kind of like history repeats itself kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that you can learn a lot about the old horsemanship too. <clears throat> he actually wrote for Western Horsemen for a long time. And I think some of the older guys will know that. They, I've got a few Western Horsemen's that have some of his old stories in it. Yeah. I, um, so, you know, it's, it's, I, I love... I love listening to those old uh, those old cowboys, vaqueros. Um, I'm reading uh, Teddy Blue Abbott's uh, "We Pointed Them North" um, just about all the way through there, but and that kind of it kind of reinforces my feeling that the cowboy has always been a dying breed since day one. Because you know, even back then in the in the old vaquero standard, you know, technology was technology was changing. Um, you listen to uh, 
Teddy Abbott talk in those first cattle drives said there was more sword-backed horses by the time they got up to uh, Montana territory that like you couldn't believe. And then just a few years later, the the saddle quality had uh, had increased, you know, by leaps and bounds, and tech, you know the way they did things had had changed and you know how they and he's talking about the point and the swing man and the flank and the drags you know when you're moving a cattle a cow herd and uh, and then all of a sudden you know you've got railroad uh you know railheads everywhere and you don't have to drive them very far and then the the way they do things changed again and then when they moved up to Montana uh you know things changed again and you know and just things have always been changing. They've always said, you know, the Cowboys uh, going out of business, but yet here we are still punching cows, still doing a lot of things the old way. We do right. things a lot different uh, than we did back then, but there's some of those things that we just never found a better way to do it because uh, it worked pretty damn good the first time. So why fix it? Well, you're never going to find a computer that can start a cult. No, no, I'm sorry. I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think never that's impossible. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think looking I mean, back can, at some of those, can, but... yeah, I think looking back at some of those deals, I uh, yeah, that the the cowboy's been a dying breed since day one, and uh, I think we always will be a dying breed. But I don't think uh, they'll ever get rid of us. That's that's one thing's for sure. There's there's just certain people that are they take to it and. Yo, know, I uh, I know that I could make uh, quite a quite a little bit more money doing something else, but I wouldn't love it, and uh, I don't I don't mind uh, the low pay and the long hours. I just I like being a horseback. I like uh, it, it's there's a certain satisfaction when uh, you know you uh, you see, especially on my end in the feedlot, you see something sick. I mean, just dog shit sick, and. Uh, you know, you get them out of the, the pen, you know, cool, easy out of walk, run them through the chute, give them a shot, and you look at them a couple of days later, and they're running and bucking around the pen. You know, that they did a good job on that one. And uh, you're just, uh, there's a satisfaction yeah. doing that, whether you're uh, where you're moving them to, to winter pasture and, uh, you know, everything's starting to slow down, you know, the calm before the storm, you know, there's just, there's something something satisfying about that you know it's it's uh it's kind of like when you're building fence and you look back and you can see straight four wire fence you're like that sucked but boy it sure looks good now you know i did a did a good job on that one there's a satisfaction to it and uh, a lot of those those office jobs i don't think you get that you know everybody has their little niche in this world Mm -hmm. And I, when I was in the jewelry industry, there'd be people come in there and they come from a whole different walk of life to work on that jewelry, you know. And, you know some of them, they've been doing it for 40 years. And that was what they were good at. And they just really shined at it. We had one kid, he come in there, he was a mechanic. And I thought, how in the world do you go from being a mechanic to being a jeweler, you know, and then yeah. I thought about, well, gosh dang, <laughs> I myself, myself, I went from buckaroon to being a jeweler, and I was just like, I guess I, uh, I'm kind of like the pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> yeah, yeah I say, you came yeah. from a, a big circle outfit, uh, South Carolina, working on, on jewelry. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really last, but I tried, you know. Yeah, but the problem with buckaroo is it gets in your blood and it gets in your bones, and even though you're out there freezing your fingers off and freezing your toes, yeah, it's or, fun uh, how you just you just absolutely dig it. There's nothing else that you'd rather be doing. Yeah, I you know. I was talking to. Uh, do you know Darren Little? Uh, he's a cowboy songwriter out of Wyoming, and he had the same thing. He he said, you know what? the end of the day i just i can't think of anything else i'd rather do so you just keep at it you know the pay sucks the people ain't much better the cows try to kill you the horses don't want you on their back but i sure love it <laughs> i sure love it yeah 
Ooh, Isn't that something? Oh, it's, it's and we'll just keep on doing it till we get old and ratchet, crotchety and rickety, and we're just yep. But I was just talking to my amigo here. <laughs> yeah, ahead. and I say there's uh you know, there's just something about it, and uh, but that like I've said since I started this deal is uh, it's it's that way of life that re- that breeds uh you know some of the best stories you'll ever hear but there's always a there's always a competition in the cowboy world with the story it's it's kind of like the we were the fishing story before fishing stories were cool you know there's uh if i rope the you know 800 pound steer somebody else is going to rope a 1200 pound cow and then that guy the next guy is going to rope a 3000 pound bull which doesn't exist but you know that that's that's the story and they're sticking to it but uh, you know, there's, there's a one upsmanship and right. in, in storytelling, but that's what makes them so cool. And, uh, but there's, there's a whole lot of truth to it. And, you know, while, while that, that bull may probably almost certainly didn't weigh 3000 pounds, he might've been a big bastard and, and a fighter, you know, it might've seemed like 3000 pounds at the end of that line, but you know, there's, there's always a, there's always a grain of truth to all of it. And, uh, I, I just, the way the world is today, you know, everybody's so at each other's throats. Um, I just, I figured we needed Scott Hall and we'd, we'd talk a little horse and cow wrecks because, uh, you know, even uh, even in the most non-glamorous parts of our life, there's still some humor to be found. And uh, more often than not, if you see somebody get freight trained, you're going to go help a guy out. You're going to help him up, but you're going to be laughing as you're <laughs> as you're extending a hand to help him off the ground. And uh, and there's always going to be some smart ass remark that's said as <laughs> as it's all happening. And uh, but that's just that's how it is. And if you can't if you can't handle that, you you ain't cut out to to punch cows very long right right oh my gosh it brings to mind a couple of different stories right off the get go <laughs> one one little roping story we were working over there by wild horse nevada and i, I just jump right in because if if i don't say it i'm gonna forget oh yeah know? let's just just but, go and go i was for working it. for him <laughs> so I was working for Ellison Ranch and Company, and uh, you know Ellison's—they run country all over the place over there in northern Nevada. Mm. And they had a place over by Wild Horse that they had picked up from Benny Binion. You know, uh, up one draw. Where's Wild Horse at? Uh, have a bunch of food. Wild, Wild Horse is north of Elko. If you okay. just head straight north, like you're going to Owyhee. Okay. Yeah. Right, right through there. Yeah, that's sure enough. There's a little big, lake up in there. Big buckaroo country up in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, good country. Yeah. Really good country. Um, anyway, so <laughs> we've been gathering yearlings off this deal for like a good week solid. And it wasn't, it didn't seem to me back then to be that big of a place, but those, yearlings would get away from you mm-hmm. uh, a lot of willows going down through the draws you know and, and some of those draws were washed out pretty good but those critters that hide down there in in the willows and you couldn't find them you just kept gathering cattle and gathering cattle and the last few days um we had a, a little heifer that she got she just kind of escaped us a few times and finally old Scotty Southway he got a rope and she dove into a draw and this this draw was only about 8 10 feet deep and only probably about 15 20 feet wide and so when he tried to drag her out of it well she'd hit the edge of that draw you know cuz it was it was pretty steep right through there where that creek went through it mm-hmm. and she just couldn't she just couldn't get up over the ledge if you tried to drag her through it. Yeah. And uh, I had this bright idea because, you know, those calves would get pretty waspy and they'd want to take you pretty bad. So so I thought, as hard as she's running at us, you know, I'll see if Scott's up to this. I'll have him, I'll have him kind of point her in my direction and I'll try to outrun her up out of that draw. Yeah. 
<laughs> out of that wash. And um, you can kind of see where this is going. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, there is very little graceful about a cow hand on foot either. I mean, there's like, we all figure what? out we can run a little faster than we thought when something's in your hip pocket. But there's nothing graceful or pretty about it. <laughs> it is just, it just all <laughs> knees and elbows everywhere. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly how it was. And I jumped in that little wash with her. And I took off running the other way. And I had told Scott before we started, I said, if she starts to eat my lunch, you know, you need to rally up and shut her down, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know when, at what point he decided to shut her down, but it, before she shut down, she probably hit me three or four times and <laughs> stepped on my spurs <laughs> at least three or four times as well. Uh, yeah, he yeah. pushed me out of that drum. He didn't take his turns. Until she was out of the draw. <laughs> like, son of a gun. <laughs> well, I had to get her out. <laughs> I had to make sure she was out. <laughs> I had to get her out. <laughs> we get her up the other side, you know. What, what else are you going to do? Because that country was just rough enough. Once you got them on a rope, you had to go and grab a pickup. Mm. And we were like, okay, how are we going to get her out of here? We can't get a pickup and trailer in here. So <laughs> we we tied her down, and we went and we got us a couple of logs, and we <laughs> put them on the flatbed pickup. <laughs> we rolled her up those logs. All, I think there was like six or seven of us. We rolled her up them logs <laughs> into the back of the truck. <laughs> Sorry, I keep getting the phone tilted way back. <laughs> oh, that's – I had oh, one of those was days uh, the other day, like – uh, I was so we had one of our our pen riders quit, and uh, so I've been kind of flying solo, which I don't mind. I kind of, you know, I, I like people, but I kind of like them from a distance. And when I'm checking cows, I like to, yeah, you know, I, I have one of my ear my earbuds in, and I, I put put something on. I listen, and I just, you know, I'm I'm there with my own thoughts, and uh, you know, I'll take a note here and there to if I, I think it's something worthwhile to mention in the podcast, but. Uh, we had a couple loads of big pregnant dairy heifers going out. And, uh, so, and I, I had to, I was, I was running a little late cause I had to drop my little girl off at school. So, uh, and they were, they were shipping Mexican cattle too. So I, you know, was clock in and just haul ass, throw a, throw a saddle on, you know, get you a couple bites of breakfast, you know, over there, but we got to go. And, uh, so I, I go, we had two, two loads going out. I go grab the first load and, uh, get them, get them up to the chute. And I go back and I'm grabbing the second load and, uh, crossing the feed alley. And there's a little, little stray out in the alley. So I kicked her, kicked her in right then just because we, we'd been having, uh, feed truck issues. One of the, one of the trucks, the clutch went out. So, we couldn't slow down for those those cattle in the alley, and it's a real narrow alley, you know, just just wide enough for the feed one feed truck to go through. And uh, so every time if he had to stop and open a gate for those those heifers, that truck would die, and they'd play hell getting it started again. So I just I kicked her in the alley real quick, and, uh, and then I go catch up to my my big pregnant heifers. Next thing you know, one of them must have sloughed a calf because she was coming back in heat. And uh, here she is, high centered over over the top cable of this fence with about four other of those fourteen hundred pound monsters just raping the shit out of her, you know. And I was like, God. Ah. And I'm not on my I'm not on a big horse either. And I was like, ah. this heifer is probably she's probably thirteen hundred pounds at least. And I was like, son of a bitch, I, I really don't want to have to yank this this heifer off the off the fence plus she's going home so i don't want to scratch her up a whole lot and luckily i uh so i i go in the pen and i was uh and i i throw my loop and she ducked her head but then she must have got just enough momentum and she went ahead and crawled off the fence but uh, thank god <laughs> but but then it wasn't more than like 20 minutes later uh, it was about half hour later i got i got the trucks loaded and uh there's another one, not quite as big, but same way. And she is just high centered deep. Like her back legs ain't even touching the ground except for, you know, if she rocks a little bit, she can barely get her, her toes to touch. And same thing, I'm on my little, 
my little yellow mare who weighs about 900 pounds maybe and uh i'll throw a <laughs> throw a loop on her and you know get down fish a front leg through and uh and you know it was just it was slide 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 come tight and uh i took about four or five pulls at her we finally got her pulled down off the fence and i said ah these are the dumbest creatures on planet Earth. I don't know why I deal with them. It, you know, I, everybody says sheep are dumb, but I, I, I don't think they've spent a whole lot of time with Holsteins. Uh, they'll, they'll give sheep every bit of run for their money. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, Angus, Angus aren't much better either. No, those, uh, no. when you get a Angus a little worked up, whew, they are just cold-blooded killers. <laughs> I don't know what it is about that breed. They they um, caught on. Yeah, they, they really did. Boys, they still work to develop that breed. Yeah, they got them pretty, and they got all this calving ease, and they went on and on, but they forgot to breed some brains into them. <laughs> <clears throat> that's uh, that's exactly the same way on them Holsteins. You know, they got them up off the ground, so you didn't have to be hunched over when you're milking them. They got them real docile, but. They bred every sort of brain out of them and try. <laughs> those those old cows have got no try at all. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah, it's uh <laughs> it makes you makes you want to pull your hair out some days, but uh which is hard for a lot of right. these guys. They uh, they ain't got any hair to pull out. So the <laughs> Those uh, those old bald cowboys, they seem like they're a little extra cranky because they, they don't got any hair to pull on, I think. <laughs> oh, shit. I'll probably catch some hell. For, I'll catch some hell for that, but it's all right. They'll get over it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's... I was... Uh, I've told this story a couple times, I'm sure, but... There was this old boy. Hey, he still works with me. Uh, he's a he's a loader operator by trade, but I guess he buckarooed on some some fairly big outfits over in California. But he's a nice guy, old Portuguese uh, fella. But he is no hand by any means at all. Uh, like he just not not a hand, and uh, tries hard. <laughs> And uh, we we went on this pretty long stretch where we didn't have anything but but dairy heifers, and uh, we got a big slug of uh, of navy cattle. Uh, oh, I think it was two years ago, like uh, October, November, and uh, we got a load of well, I think it was like two or three loads of uh, some big old Charlay cross steers out of Jordan Valley. And these are, you know, sure enough, desert cattle had had chin waddles, earmarks all over. And, you know, some of them had two chin waddles and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, they would move. They weren't they weren't real snuffy, but you didn't have to have to ask them very hard to move. And, uh, oh, uh, this old boy had been we'd been processing heifers or dairy heifers. And uh <laughs> my buddy Jesse said he grew out his beard so he could pull on that instead of his hair. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh this old boy he uh he was just running the the lead up when we were processing these uh the Jordan Valley steers and uh they might have been heifers, I can't remember, but uh big old Charlet cross and and the guy that was running the tub apparently was not was not moving fast enough for this fella, which I, I was running the chute and I had never called more cattle yet. So, you know, things were rocking along pretty, pretty good. But this old man decided, uh, you know, the tub was not moving smooth enough. For so you got to crowd him a little bit and he gets in there in the tub with him, which I, I do that pretty frequently with, uh, with Holsteins. But I, even on horseback, I don't typically get in the, in the tub with, uh, with a bunch of native cattle on you know, especially not on foot. I yeah. just stay behind the gate. But yeah, old fella, he gets in there, and next thing you know, I just it, it just filters up the line of people processing that. Uh, uh, hey, old John is uh, he got mucked out? And I said, of, of course he did, because this guy's also very accident prone. Um, that, that guy could uh, he could fuck up a wet dream. <laughs> I swear to God. 
And, uh, <laughs> and so I just said, oh, of, of course he did. Why, why was he in the tub? And uh, <laughs> we get back there and, you know, they'd, they'd open the, the tub gate and let the, let the cattle out before he got just trampled plumb to death. But <laughs> we get back there and he's, he's just curled up in the, you know, as much in the fetal position as he could because he's kind of a crippled up old man. <laughs> and he's just going, uh, I read some bitch. Uh, I read some bitch. I didn't get that red some bitch. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you could tell he hit his heart, head pretty hard. He was, uh, he was kind of lucid, but not really. And uh, we, <laughs> we ended up sending somebody up to the shop to get a creeper. And we carried him out of that tub on a mechanic's creeper. And, uh, <laughs> set him in the back seat of a pickup. <laughs> I think he had a he had a mild concussion, but I mean, no no major issues. But <laughs> like even in the hospital, he kept saying, "I, I want a piece of that red some bitch." <laughs> wow. We end up wow. Uh, we end up docking the or you know notching the horns on him, and I uh, kept the tip of it, and I wood burned red some bitch on it, and gave it to him for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's good stuff right there yeah it oh. was it was fun. I, I, I you know my norm regular listeners they've heard that story several times by now but i just never gets old every time i think of it i cracks me up <laughs> he was just just you know in the most awkward uh <laughs> fetal position you've ever seen in your life and he's just mattering a wet hand at, the, at that red some bitch <laughs> Uh, that's, that's like that Justin Palmer man. He's he's always got some kind of wreck that he's telling me about. <laughs> One day he decided he was going to burn the bitches, <clears throat> and so he's he's out there burning the weeds off the ditches. And this guy's got to be washed over. I mean, yeah, he's had so many damn wrecks. And I don't know how he lives through them, but. He's going along with his weed burner. And he lights a fire on the ditch in one spot. This can kind of burn along. Then he lights the ditch on the other side. It's kind of burning along. He keeps it going down the ditch. Pretty quick, he's got the flames going on both sides of him. <laughs> I don't know why in the world he wouldn't just start on one end and go to the other. But he started on one end and then went down to the other. And don't ask me how it happened, but the wind picked up and blew this fire from both directions towards him. Oh. <laughs> and so pretty quick, he's caught in between these two great big, I mean, he said those planes had to be 230 foot high, just crazy. Oh. You know how it gets when it's burning. Oh, man, oh, my yeah. Gosh. Absolutely burned alive is beyond me. He said he'd come out of it unscathed. <laughs> I was like, man, oh my, you're a freaking idiot. Why Why do you put yourself in that position, you know? Oh, no kidding. I'm, I'm always looking for a way out because oh, yeah. too many times. Yeah, you, know, that, you get caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> I've, uh, I've seen too many of them uh, prairie fires because I, like, I hadn't really been – uh, around, you know, like these big, long, sustained uh, wildfires because we don't have that much fuel out on the plains. So what fuel we have burns real hot and real quick. Um, you know, with, I yeah. think my buddy Clint's place, when uh, when that fire hit them, that particular fire hit, uh, it was like 50,000 acres in 12 hours is what it burned. Uh, and, Ooh. but yeah, yeah, you know, it, uh, it was a transformer that blew, sparked off, and then it jumped, you know, then, of course, it's high plains, so 70-mile-an-hour sustained winds that day, and uh, jumped uh, jumped the fi- or a road into some CRP, which is just, I mean, that CRP is just as just as flammable as any of the, that overgrown shit in California that's, that's going up. Yeah, it's just the same type of deal, and <laughs> yeah, off to the races then, and yeah. then when you got you got seventy mile an hour winds naturally, and then uh, and then you know then you got the the wind that the fire creates too. <laughs> yeah, those old boys work work their ass off trying to trying to get that thing out, and yeah, you know, they got it out the next day, but 
four, I think it was 40 something miles of fence. Uh, Clint had to replace that, that year. It was a, uh, <laughs> that shit spreads in a hurry. Yeah. Yeah. Over in, uh, the Arco, Idaho area where I was, I was running a little place over there. We'd gotten all of our cattle out of it, but about 40 head of dry cows and a couple of three head of bulls. And uh, I had them all right there close to the house because I was getting ready to ship them out. <clears throat> Somebody tossed a cigarette out the window and pretty quick, you know, it's it's going. Mm-hmm. And we had juniper trees down in this one. It was kind of a south pasture on the place. And from where I lived, I could see the whole thing going on. I don't think it took that fire two hours to go a mile. Mm. It was just screaming along with that wind, you know. And every time it would hit one of those junipers, <laughs> they would explode. Yeah. I mean, just like somebody poured gas on them. I mean, flames would roll up in the air probably 30 foot to 40 foot high in a split second. You're like, wow. Oh, yeah. Just, and yeah, like course, you said, just straight up explode. Fire. Yeah, with the wind that was blowing and, and then the wind created by that fire, yeah. it would go a hundred feet in just a, a second or two. Yeah. And then it hit another June food and you could see it start to catch on fire and then it would explode and send that fire another hundred feet, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> holy crap. I'm glad we don't got any kind of Yeah. And then, I mean, yeah. It burned at, least, <laughs> at least. Oh, shoot. Each one of those pastures was probably I'm going to say about 25,000 acres or so. Oof. And it went through three of those pastures that day. And I mean, I was scared to death. I thought for sure it was going to start coming up to where our place was at, you know? Yeah. We started loading stuff in the horse trailer, got the, got the horse trailer loaded. And because we had grazed those cattle in close before we shipped them, there wasn't enough fuel for it to hurt anything. That's and it good. just kind of petered out. The, the BLM got there and started working on it. Not that they did much good. <laughs> it had already burned two thirds of the place, <laughs> well, know, two thirds of the, the one area. Yeah, that's before they got there. Typical government job. They'll show up when when it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was all right. We uh, we needed an excuse to get out of there anyway. Yeah. So. We moved yeah, on. yeah, we moved on. It's uh, it's wild how that how that stuff works, man. It just, it just, well, you are, you feel how how powerless you really are as a human when when Mother Nature takes a hold. You're just like, holy shit. <laughs> feel uh, feel real small, real yeah, quick. That, yeah. You know, wind and. Snow or just as almost as bad as fire sometimes. That <clears throat> Harry Yunkin, he worked over there at the Rex Ranch for the LDS Church. This is a lot of years ago. He was telling me a story about how he he had a bunch of cattle in a pasture and they had a blizzard come up, and he said the winds were just absolutely fierce, and the snow was falling really heavy. And he says those cattle had run to one end of the pasture. And they kind of piled up on the fence and the snow started piling on those cattle and some of them were suffocating and some of them were freezing to death. <clears throat> and he said uh, the cattle behind them, they climbed over the top of those cattle that were on the fence. And he says it, it made a nice hard drift and they went over those cattle and went into the next pasture, went to the next fence. And he says the same thing happened again. He says his cattle started freezing to death and dying underneath that stone and suffocating, what have you. And he says they went on to the next pasture. Mm-hmm. He says this went on for miles, just mm-hmm. miles. He says we found cattle 30 miles from where they started at. Oh, yeah. It's like, holy crap, 30 miles in a storm. It's <clears> insane. <throat> yeah, yeah. It's, it's insane. They had that uh, three years ago um, there on the High Plains. We had a late spring blizzard. It was the year that I moved out here, and my wife and kids were still back in Kansas, and they uh, 
uh, they were out without power for the better part of a week. You know, they, they were able to, we had a bunch of, you know, had plenty of propane and then they had some, <laughs> some firewood to burn. And so they, you know, cooked everything there in the fireplace and whatnot. But those old boys, uh, I, I think it was well into the, like pretty well, like next cabin season where before they finally got everything sorted out. But, you know, there was just cattle everywhere. Yeah, just you know, mm. like you said, they just huddle up against that fence line. They'd get snowed in, and they just get to push. And next thing you know, they'd either push that fence over, or the the snow would pile up enough where they just walk over the top of it, and they just keep keep going until they got to the next one. And yeah, there was there was cattle everywhere. And uh, I think uh, that yard I worked at in one feed alley, they had about two hundred and something dead. Just just one one alley. It was. I don't know how many cattle they lost wow. uh, on that that storm, but it was it was bad. It puts uh it really puts a perspective on uh <laughs> on how volatile of a business running cows is because uh you know one little yeah. storm like that, just one little drop in the snow from from Mother Nature, and ooh, you got you had people uh you know lose lose their entire livelihood on that deal, and <laughs> it's it's rough. Yeah, that's sometimes the, you know, calving out cows and what have you, you see some ugly stuff. You know, you'll see a bunch of scours come through, and scours is the strangest thing because some years it just doesn't matter what you doctor with. Mm -hmm. In other places, they figured it out. and They've got a program that works pretty good. But <clears throat> I was working for a guy over in Buell, Idaho. It's been four or five years ago now, we had a pretty bad winter. And uh, over in Buell in that country, they don't generally have real heavy snow. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that city of Buell had <laughs> sold all their snow equipment because they just didn't ever have to worry about it for like 20 years. They didn't have much snow. Mm -hmm. And the year I decided to calve out for this guy, we just happened to be getting a lot of snow. And it started coming on and, I wasn't too worried about it. I thought this guy that I worked for kind of had his crap in a pile. So I thought, I oh, will be all right. You know, we'll build a little shelter for these heifers to cab them. And we'll be just fine. Yeah. Well, we bought this bunch of heifers from over in Bruno, Idaho, and they were bred to a clone bull of a world champion bull. Oh. Well, that sounds all well and good. You know, that sounds pretty cool. It has a bunch of fancy calves, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, these calves had hit the ground and they wouldn't get up. Mm -hmm. And the first I thought, well, no big thing, you know, they're heifers. It's awful cold, pretty snowy and blowy. And we were in Buell where there's not a lot on the on the farm pastures there. There just wasn't a lot of protection for those cattle. So I thought, oh, that's what the problem is, you know. Well, as winter grew on, we were losing an awful lot of cash to those scours, and we didn't have a very good scour program in place. But basically, calf would be born. We'd take him inside, feed him colostrum, and get him warmed up and going and put him back on a cow. And the next thing you know, he'd get the scours. And, yeah. You know, it would snow and then warm up and melt and then snow and warm up and melt and snow. And so we were fighting, trying to keep these calves alive after they were born and, of course, scours, which is not uncommon. Yeah. The people we were running into is we couldn't get these calves to get up off the ground. Mm -hmm. They would lay there. And I, I thought, well, it's got to be the cold. But it became apparent that probably 90% of these calves would not get up off the ground. Are they little bitty calves? They just lay there. Yeah, even though the cows were lick, you know, heifers were licking them off, mm -hmm. they wouldn't get up. <laughs> I bet it was one but of those was, great uh, Cavanese bulls. Uh, one of the one of the deals with low birth weight Probably Cavanese is they uh, they calve a little earlier. Uh, their gestation period's not quite as long, and I think a lot because we had that issue too there when I was in the feedlot, and you know it's. First thing is like, well, it's the feedlot, you know, they're they're weak and whatnot, and it's dirty. But I I think those calves were just a little undercooked, you know, they weren't 
that they looked fully developed, but they, they were kind of like little ratty calves. And, um, boy, you had to, you really had to, to baby them. And a lot of them, they just, yeah, like you said, they just wouldn't get up and suck. And, uh, you'd pump, you'd pump them full of colostrum and you'd, uh, you know, you'd try to, and it's, it's fine if you got, you know, two, three hundred, four head, a hundred head of cows that, that you're calving and you get one or two or 10 of those that, <clears throat> that you got to work on, you know, makes your, <clears throat> your life tough. But when like every other one and you're, you're calving 1200 head, <laughs> just it's a lot of extra work for you. And, uh, yeah, I, I, just, I, uh, I, I like the, the Cavanese bulls, but we got to be careful with some of them. Cause I, like I said, I think they just don't, they don't cook long enough and, uh, and they're just, they don't have much of a chance when, when it's like that. They just, you know, they don't have any energy. They don't, you can give them B12 and Glostrum and Cairo syrup and whatever. And it just, <laughs> it just ain't enough. They just don't, you can try every trick in the book and. Put them in a hot box and uh, it's just it's rough it is it'll make you work mm-hmm. i uh i probably lost about 20 pounds that winter i mean i was in tip top shape after winter was over with. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but this guy i'm working for now he's kind of got her figured out he ended up uh he decided to start raising longhorns yeah and uh he'd use those for heifer bulls and he even went as far as to get them all so that everything is bred up to black. I mean, they yeah. got horns. But they're, they're all a bunch of black longhorn cattle. And mm-hmm. It's the coolest thing. Little itty bitty calves. I and bet those some big boy, running motherfuckers when, once up. they get up, uh, once they get up and get to going, I bet you play hell trying to tag or earmark a calf when if he's got a, about 10 days on him. Right. <laughs> you know, so far, as far as quiet cattle, I've been around a few quiet places, and this is probably some of the most quiet cattle I've been around. Yeah. You know, for a guy who's had a big place, he's really worked on disposition and worked on frame size, you know, so that he could run on the desert, mm-hmm. grazes year round, you know. Pretty dang good operator. I I kind of feel bad. I'm blowing out of here directly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're talking in a couple of days. I'm moving on, but I'm not moving on for just the typical cowboy excuse. I've got family <laughs> issues going yeah. on that need to be taken care of. So we yeah. gotta go take care of stuff at home. That's you know, one of the things on the uh, but man, with, I'll tell you with cowboys there. Most of them don't need much of an excuse to to head on out. It's usually just like, well, I didn't like how they're doing. It. The guy pissed me off. I'm heading out. <laughs> that gate wasn't hanging just so. <laughs> yeah, I asked him three times <laughs> to, to, to fix him. that gate. Granted, I asked him three times in a five minute span, and it didn't happen. But still, he didn't fix that gate. I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah, all it is is guys like to see new country and they want mm-hmm. to see how so and so does it. And see what's it like down in New Mexico in the winter time? <clears throat> yeah. And what's it like over in California when they're punching cows? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh I it was sure that guy. Neat. I was that guy. I've I've done that uh I've done that quite a few times mm-hmm. myself and uh Luckily, only one time I've, I've had to do that with uh, with a wife and kids. Cause that, that that makes it a little harder <laughs> to just up and move when when you got a family trailing along behind you. But it's uh yeah, there's there's been you know I've been I guess Montana, Kansas, Colorado, now Nevada. So I've uh, I've seen a little bit. I haven't, but there's guys that you know shit. You can't count. On uh, on two hands, the number of states they punch cows in, and uh, I, I'm not quite that that much of a drifter. I've uh, had a little more little more of a of roots take place than that. But there's guys that you know. Uh, I I had uh, James Shoshone on here the other day, and he he was talking about the place he's been, or he just left. He'd been there for a year and a half, and that's the most he's ever worked at a place in his life. And uh, well, he do you know James? <laughs> I do. I know James. I don't know. 
not too many guys that actually buckaroo don't know James Shishon. That's kind of yeah. what I figured. Well, he's got some stories now. I, I sure liked visiting with him. And uh, I think he, I think he enjoyed yeah, the conversation enough. I, I can get him back on. So that's that's cool. I I I just love hearing those those stories because there's there's a lot of those outfits. I like, I never never uh, had the chance to go uh, you know go go out to cow camp or I've never had a chance to follow a wagon and uh, I like hearing those you know live vicariously through the guys that actually did it. But uh, my 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 style of cowboy has been completely different than. You know, a lot of the guys like you out here in the in these western states so it's it's cool hearing those stories i think i think the more we can we can get those stories out there and give the normal public a view of what cowboy and actually is and it's not it's not marlboro man it's not yellowstone and it's not it's not all all john wayne shit it's uh it's a lot of fucking work most of the time right i i think uh that's a it's kind of a strange world. You know, you've got some places where it's dedicated to just buckarooing and, mm -hmm. you know, this group of guys, what they've got to do is go chase cows. And in the morning, they, the boss ropes their horse off the ropes. If they're on a buckaroo outfit, you know, I, I'm not sure what it's like in Texas and Arizona and places like that. But when I was working for Ellison's and working for the TS, places like that, they get, the boss catches your horse in the morning and he leads him to you and you put your halter on him and a few minutes later you're you're trotting a big circle and or maybe you're trailing out somewhere way out in the middle of the desert and you spend the day moving cows or gathering cattle or mm -hmm. branding or whatever you're doing and you do that all day and then you come back home and your day's done all you did was work cattle a horseback all day yeah and uh, then there are places where like where I'm at right now, I might spend the entire day welding. Yeah. You know, and then I might spend the next day going and moving horses. Yeah. And then the next day I spend the whole day working on water troughs. And then the next day welding, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, it's not all, it's not all just buckaroo. And I mean, I wish it was. Yeah. In a perfect world. Yeah. You'd be a horseback every day, but not every place is like that. No. Uh, sometimes to get the better pay, you got to say, you know what, I'm going to go and because I want to make a better living for my family. Mm -hmm. Or, or maybe, I, and I've heard this from more than one old cowboy, that they're tired of dealing with all these punk kids. And so they go to work for a smaller place. Yeah. And that's where they settle down and they work for a little place that's got between four and 800 head of cows. And they're just tickled pink to do whatever they can do. Mm -hmm. They still get to get a horse back once in a while, but they know they know all sorts of things about the cattle industry, and yep. so they're able to help that ranch owner be successful. You know, and no, they're not going to be a horseback every day. And gosh, you know, I remember guys coming along that they never did anything but blow from cow outfit to cow outfit that. All they had to do was be a horseback, mm -hmm. and I, and I had guys make fun of me when I when I like when I quit the Sunlight Ranch. Um, one of the cowboys says to me, Scott, you'll wear lace up boots for the rest of your life. You go to that oil field. <laughs> 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 and I I thought to myself, you know, he might be right. Yeah. But by dang, I'm gonna make a good living, and maybe someday I'll own my own cows. You know. Yeah. And uh, well. Consequently, I had an offer to be a cow boss on a place, and I was like, ooh, dang, I'm going after that cow boss position. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, no, I didn't end up being the guy that went to the oil field for the rest of his life. But by dang, I had the opportunity a time or two to, to be the foreman, you know, to be the cow boss and to get to, to run the entire show except for, you know, main management. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this is what it's all about right here. A little bit more stress. Didn't have to saddle up the bucking horses all the time. I got to ride some nice horses. Yeah. Got to, uh, of course, you know, you get on both ends of the spectrum and you start to figure out, well, 
when I was the boss, I did it this way. And then pretty quick, that deal come to an end, whether it's sold or whether the owner went to prison, tongue in cheek. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's a whole other story. Yeah. (laughs) So, so, you know, not everything's going to last, but you get to another place and you get a crappy cow boss who either doesn't know his stuff or he's just a big jerk to you all the time. Mm-hmm. And you blow on to the next place or, or maybe you decided to pick an, a whole other career. Mm-hmm. You learn little things over time that make you better. Yep. And I think that's what a lot of guys are all about is as long as they're moving ahead, as long as they're growing, they're pretty content. Yep. Now, I have to admit, a a time or two, I felt like I quit growing, like things were getting kind of blasé, and I wanted to get better. I wanted to improve. You just feel a little stale. And so I said, you know what? I'm moving on. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I I think that's what a lot of guys crave is they want to get better. Yeah. They want to learn a new country. They want to... We like a challenge. We're very competitive. And... uh, and, you know, and a lot of it is like, well, I, I can do it best. But a lot of it is just like, hey, uh, you know, if you if you try this, try this. You know, a lot of that, I, I hear that so many times. Uh, just try this. And uh, and I, I've heard like now I know this makes no sense in the world, but it works. And we had a we had a pin of cattle uh, when I was in Kansas that for whatever reason, uh, mostly because it was a dumb shit that was in charge of designing these new pins. So we took a, a finished feedlot with a bunch of smaller, you know, this this particular alley. We had a couple pins that were like, you know, 150, 200 head pins. And then we had a whole bunch of them that were like just little load lot pins, just, you know, 50, 60 head. But we took out all the cross fences and we made like on each side of the feed alley, we made, you know, like three or four big pins that we could run, you know, I think they were right at 750 foot of bunk space, you know, so big long pins and that's what we were calving our cows in but they took out all the the drover the cowboy alleys <clears throat> and we'd pull them through the through the bunk gates and, and push them down the feed alley and and this one particular hmm. pin we'd set it so you'd uh you'd go out the south end of the uh out the south bunk gate and you'd push them to the end of the feed alley and we had some gates across there and then you know you'd pull the pin and then you'd push them back the other way to to get get into the the cowboy alley and push them up to the hospital. And for whatever reason, they'd get to the gate and they'd stop and ball up there at the gate. <clears throat> but if you set the gates right there and you made them double back on themselves, they would go out that gate. No problem. For whatever reason, you know, that never works with cattle. If you make them double back on themselves, they always, you know, the, the, the cattle that are still in the, in the pen or the, the pasture that you're pulling, They'll just follow on the fence line, but they'll never go out the gate, it seems like. But for whatever reason, it worked yeah. on that particular pin. I don't know how many guys I told him. I said, I, I know it sounds crazy, but it works. Trust me, it works. <laughs> and I had I had my boss, <clears throat> we were trying it like that one time, doubling back on themselves. And we had all but about 10 head out of the, out of the pin. And he comes hauling ass down the alley in the pickup blaring the horn and pushing cattle back back south on us and what do you know they all come back in the pen on us what the fuck are you doing it's, well that's not going to work it was working until you pushed them back in the pen why why did you do that i've never been so mad at a boss in my life i was i'm usually pretty level headed and uh and i can explain my case but it was one of those like you know those you, you know, like you have a certain set of cattle or a certain pasture or whatever that you know you wake up in the morning and you know it's gonna f- be a fight just for whatever reason things aren't you know they don't work right at with those particular cattle or that particular outfit that particular place you know it's not gonna be an easy job and so you you wake up with a chip on your shoulder in the morning just knowing it's gonna suck and then you almost have the job done without a hitch. And uh, and the boss man pushes them right back on top of you <laughs> and insists that you try it the other way that conventional wisdom says will work, but it doesn't. For whatever reason, it don't. And, oh, I lost my shit. 
<laughs> that might have been the the beginning of the end at that place for me, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, your your son's watching along, so Jesse Jesse told you hi. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, he's he's down in South Carolina right now, just living it up in ever the warm since country, left. huh? <laughs> well, ever since he left Idaho, he's been wishing he was Buckaroo. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Yeah, and he's determined he's gonna he's gonna grow up to be something. So, oh well, good. I guess uh, I guess that's his forte. He's he's a go getter. Well, he's one I, of them uh, type A personality. There you go. <laughs> I will say, um, not nothing against the ladies of Idaho and Nevada and whatnot. There's just a lot more of them down in South Carolina, and they're. Uh, there's a lot of pretty ladies down there in the South, so I, I don't blame them for, for being in South Carolina. Yeah, that's one that's one pull that he has. I think her name's Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> little Southern Belle. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been the downfall of many a good cowboy, I think, but that's all right. Oh, my God. I'm sure yes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, – yeah, it's uh, – you know, there, it's a hell of a life uh, working on horseback, working cows. It's uh, it ain't for the it ain't for the weak of heart, but uh, you know, it's it's sure a lot of it's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of days where you you just wanna you wanna throw every just burn everything in a pile and and go take an office job because you don't have to deal with bullshit. But and then as soon as you sit down in the cubicle, you're like, fuck! I wish I would have kept my saddle. <laughs> And right. it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's just fun more than anything. It, it's fun. Uh, you know, I, I look back through, through history and, you know, and, and you look at some of like the early cow punchers, uh, I got, I think the, on the Vaquero side, they've got, uh, it was, it was built out of, a. You know the the California style uh, ranching and horsemanship. It was more. It was built out of necessity, but it was built over several hundred years. The cowpuncher style was like, all of a sudden, civil war is over, and we've got a booming cattle industry, and not really a whole lot of people that knew how to how to do it. And uh, they learned on the fly in a real big goddamn hurry. It seemed like you know, and that's that's kind of the main difference between punching and buckaroo is buckaroo and correct me if i'm wrong scott this is just from my my experience is um not often are you in a big hurry on a on a buckaroo outfit like you a lot of a lot of those guys would way rather take your time and uh and do it calm quiet and you know and if you don't get everything done well you find a good stopping spot and you 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 regroup the next day and do it again. And when you get to the puncher style, it's just like, man, it is going to be 105 degrees here in about an hour. Let's get this shit done now. I mean, it's just a go. And, uh, and I, but, uh, looking through history, that's kind of how the, the Texas cattle industry was started. It's like, we got to figure out how to get these cattle back East. Who's got an idea. Let's do it. Let's go. And, uh, and then you you learn on the fly, but it seemed like the you know in the Great Basin in the California area they had a couple hundred years to figure it out, and uh, and that I, from like I said, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be from my experience kind of the the biggest difference between the the puncher and the buckaroo. You know, I was raised in a family of buckaroos, whether they want to admit it or not. Yeah, um, <laughs> they were. They were those people who were like, well, there's always tomorrow. Mm -hmm. There's always tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my dad would say it all the time. Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. Don't be in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And he was maybe a little too laid back, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was like, man, somebody got a fire under this guy's behind because <laughs> he was way too chill. And he didn't give a crap what other people thought. I mean, you could not shame him into climbing a horseback. I mean, it was more important for him to go and visit his buddies 
yeah. than it was to go out and work cattle. I mean, he just, he was just really laid back. Mm. And on the flip side of it, I had my mother who was one of those type A personalities, you know, go, 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 get it done. We got a lot of work to do and we're going to get the gardening done, the cooking done. And mm-hmm. she's going to clean the house and we're going to work cattle. And I mean, a hundred different things. Well, she was raised in a whole different family than dad was, you know? Yeah. The family was in the <laughs> So-and-so over here, they're working cows and I'm going to go give them a hand. and I can get mine done later. It's not a big thing. Yeah. And, uh, well, it's just there was that different personality. But when I went to work for Ellison's, you know, you'd start out at a certain time every day. You could be pretty well assured that you're going to be to work around seven. Mm-hmm. And uh, you were usually going to work until five to six o'clock at night. And I just kind of got used to that. And we would, my cow boss had it figured out how much work he could get done by lunch. Mm -hmm. And I never appreciated him for years and years that I worked. I worked for the Spanish ranch for about three years. And there were things that I appreciated and things I didn't appreciate. I, and I could go on and on about things I don't appreciate, but what the hell's the point of that? Yeah. Um, The thing that I look back, I was like, wow, this guy made sure that we were done in time to go have lunch. Mm -hmm. We get done eating lunch and we go back to work about, you know, we'd have about an hour of time to eat and go chillax for a minute and then back out we'd go. Yeah. And we'd go get the rest of the work done. And things were kind of, I don't want to say timed, but you knew that you could get so much work done in a day. Mm-hmm. And they had a, a regular routine that they did year after year. Yep. And a lot of people that I worked with, they would cuss that cow boss that I had mm-hmm. and say, well, I, you know, so and so fired him, blah, blah, blah. And, and he ain't no hand and on and on they'd go. Well, I learned over time that it's not always about being the best horseman. It's not always about being the best cowman. Being Sometimes the best hand. Not. That's something that that guy shows up every day, mm-hmm. year round. You know, he doesn't ever call in sick. He doesn't yep. go get drunk at night and show up worthless the next day. Yep. You know, this guy has his crap together. Yeah. And, uh, Sure, he's not the best horseman in the bunch. Sure, he's not the best man to ride into a herd of cows and sort. Yep. But you can count on him, you know. You can count on him showing up day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And pretty quick you realize it's not always just being a good cowboy. Sometimes it's about being a good man. Yep. You know, some guys, yeah, they've been around to 20 different cow outfits. And they've worked there twice. Mm-hmm. And everybody knows him. The guy's practically famous. Yeah. But his attitude is crap. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody wants to work around him because he never has a good thing to say about anything. Yeah. I I had a guy that and worked for me and he was he was pretty damn handy, but never never had a good thing to say about anybody. And you know, after after he ran through the list of pretty well everybody that I'm working with and talking about how they're, uh, they don't know anybody. And I, I punched for, you know, I buckarooed for this guy and I, I know this guy and I, you know, I had Ernie Marsh build me this bit, uh, you know, got his, got his number and whatnot. He doesn't, he doesn't answer me anymore, but I got his number. And well, like after he's ran down everybody else on the, on the outfit, you're like, what, what's he saying about me behind my back? And turns out, well, yeah, he was talking a little shit behind my back too. And, uh, I, I just, I don't, I don't, know, I, I don't, I don't understand people like that, but they're, that's just people, I guess. And, uh, and after a while, you know, I've, uh, you know, kind of coming up through the cowboy world. I, I always kind of, held a grudge at some of those guys that just didn't didn't want to help you at all and then after about six seven people that i've trained and and tried to help out where i can and then i get to the point where 
yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, tell you how I do things and tell you why it works for me and, and, you know, how, how I do certain things, you know, like I, I don't ever, or very rarely when I pull a calf, I don't take them at a diagonal across the pin. There's just too much ground to cover if they want to cut back. So I drive them to, to the fence take them down the fence line and then you've got you basically got another cowboy right there in the fence like that, that fence is your friend and uh mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll tell people that and next thing you know i see him trying to you know trying to be highbrow cat out there in the middle of the pen driving this calf diagonal just take him to the fence <laughs> and then your, your horse ain't gonna have to work near as hard that calf ain't gonna get near stirred up just bring him down the fence line and then after you keep watching them yeah. do do the thing you tell them is going to be way harder. You keep watching them. Keep watching. Well, I'm just going to stop giving you advice. If you're not going to take the advice, I'm not going to give it. It's not worth worth my time. So figure it out on your own. And after you have a whole slug of those people, and then you're just at the I'm at the point where like fuck, I just as soon work longer hours and do it myself because that that's that's the big part about this outfit here is that you know they, they pay me good uh you know they treat me really well but the biggest part is they leave me the fuck alone <laughs> just they they know that I, I i know what i'm doing and i'm pretty decent at what i do uh we may have uh, a few wrecks here and there because that's you're working with cattle and horses that's going to happen but by and large my death percentage is that is beyond acceptable and uh and my cattle they ship out in good health and uh good shape and they're pretty quiet so they just leave me the hell alone and let me do my job and that's the biggest part but now we're gonna get busy at some point and we're gonna need somebody else to help and i'm just like god hey can we get somebody who knows anything just if, if they can if i can get somebody who can pick up two back feet every third cha- uh, every third loop that would be fucking amazing. You know, I just, somebody that <laughs> has some little bit of know-how and I have no problem teaching people, but man, when you just get burned so many times, you're like, I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I just don't want to deal with training somebody new. I want somebody that can, has, already has a, some sort of know-how. But, I think you're going to start seeing less and less and less guys that have any kind of know-how. I think uh, so. We're going into a day and age when a lot of guys that are really out there to do the physical work, they're just uncommon. And I was told this literally like 15 years ago, I was at an engraving seminar and the guys told me, they said, the people who are willing to do hand work are getting uncommon. Yeah. They said, it's going to be a rarity to have people who want to well, people who want to work cattle, people who want to, you know, be carpenters and plumbers. Mm-hmm. So the way of the new world is going to be computers. Yeah. And I thought to myself, wow, this stuff's going to start to pay decent. Once we start having a harder time finding people who know and people who want to do, Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, now that I'm 45 freaking years old, I can go out and make a living as a cowboy. I can make just as money, as good of money cowboying as I can welding. Yep. And who would have ever thought? You know, yeah, you can't really compare very easily because I get a house to live in. These guys feed my horses. Mm-hmm. Some of the places are paying for my shoeing. Yep. You know, but I still make a pretty dang good paycheck. Yeah. Who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago, here I was making a whole 900 a month, mm-hmm. <laughs> basically starting to make a living. Now, now I can go out and I can pull in 3000 a month as a cowboy. Yep. And I can pull in even more if I'm willing to go out and weld and put up fence and do the rosin jaw work as well. Sorry, I don't mean to. I don't mean to make it sound uh, a lower position to be a rosin jaw. No, it's just not cowboy. I mean, rosin jaw, 
right, it's not cow blend, but on the other hand, hey, if I do both, I'm going to make better money than if I'm just a cowboy. Yeah, exactly. And I've, I've told that to the young, uh, young guys and gals that have worked is like the more you can learn and the more that you have a, at least a general understanding of, <clears throat> the more valuable you are to to that outfit. And uh, it's and it's not a universal truth, but more often than not, uh, if you if you show that you can uh, you can do a little mechanic and do a little bit of welding, know how to put up hay or uh, drive a feed truck. Chances are you're going to get an opportunity to do that. And chances are you're going to get paid a little bit more. And like I said, that's not universally true. There's always shitty outfits that, that, that pays what it is. But, um, you know, more often than not, the more you can do, the more, the more you're worth and the more you get paid for it. Right. Yeah, I always thought for a long time, man, I don't want to be a welder. To hell with being a welder. That's hard work, you know, mm. sitting in a, underneath a potato machine, and rotten <laughs> potatoes, trying to weld up a piece of pipe. Who the hell wants to do this for a living, you know? I thought the same now, thing with a uh, years down feed trucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I don't know how many a times couple I've... years down oh. the road. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> this delay gets you sometimes. Oh, I was just going to say, it's it's only been about maybe four years since I was a welder full time. Yeah. Uh, all that knowledge that I have, this guy I work for, he sees what I can do, and he's like, "Man, it's sure nice to have somebody who knows, somebody who understands." Yeah. So that. We're not just doing shit together. We're actually able to to repair a piece of equipment instead of just, you know, let's let's patch it together and hope that let's hope that weld holds, you know. Yeah, or, you're put, uh, rather than putting a band aid on it, you're you're doing reconstructive surgery. Yep, and you know all this stuff comes into play, mm -hmm. but it makes a guy a hell of a lot more valuable to you if he's got some skills besides just punching cows, but. On the other hand, when it comes to the computer work, you're talking to the wrong guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty fortunate that I have guys like Matt McKinley who can say, Scott, go over here to Zoom and you need to <laughs> download that app. I'm like, what the, what the hell is Zoom? I'm pretty <laughs> fortunate that I can even open my phone to answer a phone call. Well, you know? look at you go now. Now you are uh, broadcast live on the World Wide Web. Telling cowboy stories, so it's a, it's a scary thing, huh? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's all good though. People people like it. That's that's one thing I found out is uh, oh, my buddy uh, Sam told me he's like, well, you kind of found your own market, and and that's true. Because uh, I I just I, I've been a big listener of podcasts for quite a while now, and there's a lot of that's the mm -hmm. good thing about podcasts is anybody can do one. Uh, it takes a little work and a, look, really not even a whole lot of know-how. They've got it set up to where it's pretty damn easy to do. Um, and, you know, the the quality of my recording early on and even now is not the best at times, but the content is good. And uh, so I, I just, I thought about what I, I like to, to listen to. And I, I some of my favorite stories I've ever heard have been, you know, at a, at a, at a meal after Brandon or sitting around a campfire or, you know, hanging out behind the, the rope and shoots or whatever, you know, at somebody's trailer after a, a rodeo. And it's just, <laughs> just talking shit, you know, just a bunch of cow hands, you know, telling war stories. And those are my, those are my favorite stories on earth. So shit, why not put it in a podcast? And it turns out there's a lot right. of people, kind of like me that like that stuff so it's it's pretty it's pretty damn neat i uh it's been a huge learning curve trying to trying to make it what it is but people keep tuning back in so we'll keep doing it and uh i got i was telling you last night uh some of the some of the, well between you and uh a couple of the bigger name people that that uh i've, I've spoke to uh but if I, anybody ask, if I ask uh, who who should be back on the show or who do I need to get on the show, Scott Hall pops up more often than not. So 
I think you yeah, I think you'll always be welcome back. I know I know we'll we'll bullshit all day long. I like I was telling you yesterday and I when I posted there's certain people that when you want to talk to them, you just got to clear your schedule. And that, that's not a knock on you. That's just a, that's a knock on us both because we, lo- we both like to talk. And <laughs> once we get going, it doesn't stop. So I got to make sure my schedule is clear <laughs> before I, I give Scott Hall a holler. <laughs> well, it just so happens, I like I said, I took a job with a guy who he is determined that his guys are going to get Sundays off. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, Man, he is just super about it. That's awesome. There's a lot of work to be done, and he wants to get the work done, but he says, you know, he says, you work a guy into the ground day after day pretty quick. He says, you can't get a full day's work out of him in 12 hours. No. He says, you can't get four hours of work out of him in 12. He says, you've got to give a man a day off. Mm -hmm. And so he lives by it. Yep. So I've got a day off today. um, I'm just packing up my stuff. I'm kind of getting my engraving outfit put into the camp trailer. I'm moving back up to Idaho, and, and so I don't have a real pressing day. So I thought, man, this is perfect. Yeah, we'll visit. It's awesome. About Cowboys. Yeah. Always, yeah. always a good, yeah. uh, always a good time. I enjoy the shit out of it, and uh, it'd been too long since we'd uh, we'd caught back up. So it's it's. Always, always good visiting with you. I mean, I, I enjoy the shit out of it. I know my listeners do too. And it's, uh, yeah, there, there, you bring, uh, you bring some authenticity to your stories and then, you know, you, you just got a, you've got a good storytelling voice and that's a, you know, uh, I, there's a, Thanks, I, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, uh, I've heard a lot of different stories and, uh, and there's there's been a couple people that I was like, man, if they just had a little different voice, that'd be a hell of a story, you know. But there's there there's a there's an artwork to to everything, you know. Whether you're whether you're engraving a concho or a bit or a gun, I've seen some of your the guns that you've engraved, and it's just I always think, how did you come up with that? But you're uh, you got an artistic mindset, and uh. But there's the same way with uh, with telling a story. I used to catch so much shit in in college, especially in college, with my some of my city friends. And they're like, "Well, you take 30 minutes to tell a story." But I was like, "Yeah, but you got to tell the backstory, and then you got to venture off over here." So everything, when it comes to to a conclusion, you know, the the punchline or whatever hits that much harder. But there, there's a you know, you got to weave it. It's a tapestry. That's right. It's a mental painting that you're doing for these people. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to see. You know, here I am. The setting is the rockiest peaks that you can imagine with juniper trees, and half of them bur- burned up on one side because there's a forest fire that came through. You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's those little you have details to tell that this matter. Part of it because, yeah, it matters. Yeah, I mean, here we go. We're we're on the driest, dustiest desert that you can imagine. And the only way that the grass grows is becomes somebody pissed in the wind about three years ago. <laughs> it finally <laughs> took root. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh yeah, there's there's definitely an art form to it. And uh I don't know if I've figured it out completely yet, but I've uh you know, there's there's just certain stories like if you don't tell this little part about it, and it may take you ten minutes to get to that point, but then you know, if you don't tell that part, then this part of the the main story doesn't make sense. So you gotta you gotta wind it all together, and uh, that's true. It just it it's just part of it. And uh, but like if you've been out, you know, even if uh, you know, just you know, been out on the desert gathering cattle, or uh, you know, whatever your your scenario is, you know, catching a trot in the morning to go, go pull a pin of, uh, of facts to, to ship, you know, whatever the, whatever the scenario is, there's certain little nuances that, that make that story unique. And, uh, if you don't tell those, then it's just another generic cowboy story that, you know, it might, it might, uh, catch or capture the attention of a city slicker, but somebody who's been out there and done that type of thing, like, well, uh, there, there's probably more to that story. And, uh, you know, you know, you can always tell when you when you're not you're not telling the full part of the story. A guy will cock his head and be like, hmm, 
doesn't sound quite right, you know. And so then you got, well, this is why. And then if you had just said that in the first place, you know, it, it makes more sense. And I don't know. There's, I said, there's a there's an art form to it. Certainly. You know, there's some situations that a lot of people will never experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you have to remember that not everybody in this world even realizes that there's still people that run wild horses. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people who work for the government who really were cowboys. They were ranchers. Mm -hmm. And now they're in the wild horse industry and they're helping to get that gather going on. And somebody has to get those jobs done. And somebody yep. has to have gained the knowledge at some point to do that. Yep. You know, and like, for instance, uh, back in the day, there was a rodeo company, and I'm not going to name them, but they had to go out onto the desert. They had turned out a bunch of mares. And uh, this was before it was illegal. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say it was illegal, but it, it wasn't as big of a deal to go out and gather their horses. And uh, they had a bunch of bucking horse mares that they turned out. And they had some stud horses that they turned out. And then there was the, the bunch of horses that was already out there. They could put on a rodeo. They needed to go and gather these cranky young horses to put on the rodeo. So they'd go out there and gather them up. Well, for a long time, it wasn't really that big of a deal. But then the BLM guys said, well, wait a minute. You know, those are our wild horses, and they're not supposed to be out there messing with our wild horses. Yeah. Well, really, what they are is they're feral horses, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it was, they, the BLM thinks that they're just out there padding their pocketbook when actually these guys turned out good bucking horses to be able to make good bucking horses. Yeah. Yeah, they took advantage of the situation, but man alive, we're trying to make a living. Yeah. You know, it's fun. Yeah, it's exciting. Sometimes wrecks happen, mm -hmm. but we're not just all out here screwing off. We're actually making a living. Yeah. And yeah, it's a little bit more exciting. It takes a little bit more skill. There's going to be times when people get in a wreck and, and it's a good wreck and it's a fun story. Yeah. And some guys, I, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there's some guys that they make wrecks and they create wrecks just because they like a good story. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I I don't know how many I don't know how many times I've seen somebody uh, take the tail of their rope and just pop a colt on the ass end just just to see the sparks fly, you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and if that that old fella on the colt uh, gets a little burr under his pad, well, guess what? You know, every cult that guy gets on is going to get popped in the ass with the tail of the rope just because that guy got pissed off about it. Instead, instead of just thinking, you know, it's, it's we're cowboying and just riding it out. Now, they they get a little they get a little hot under the collar. Well, guess what? They found your button, and they're just going to keep pushing it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, good times. Oh man, well, Matt, uh, I don't know if I'm burning up more time than we should, but I, I'm feeling like we need to get going here. All righty, you well, tell me. Yeah, I think I think we covered plenty today. I, uh, I boy, I sure had a good time, Scott. I I appreciate the hell out of you. It's good, good catching up with you. It's Scott Hall, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, we've never met in person yet. We will one of these days, and it'll be a. It'll be one for the ages, but uh, I, I'm proud to say my, my good friend Scott Hall, uh, buckaroo extraordinaire, silver silver engraver like you wouldn't believe, and just a damn good guy. And uh, I appreciate you coming back on, man. Well, Matt, I sure appreciate you taking the time and working on this podcast, and you're you're building something for the ages. Like I said before, there's information here that time kind of forgets yeah people don't realize what we're trying to do out here and they, they don't feel like it's important they're too worried about politics and they're worried about you know the end of times mm -hmm. you know we're, we're just out here trying to feed the people yeah, yeah we have a good time doing it. we're just trying to feed the people you know? yeah well so. and, you know at the end of the day 
cows don't give a shit whether you're voting for Trump or Biden or BLM or, you know, Blue Lives Matter. They don't give a fuck. They just want some grass or some hay or some corn, and uh, they just want to not die. And, if you know, a lot of them, if they think they're going to die, they want to make sure they take you with them. Uh, and that's what, that's what makes it fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love how you put that. Oh. <laughs> well, Amigo, you have yourself a good day. Yeah, you too. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Now, move your ass. Desert trails in the glow of early morning. Desert trails all the glitter in the dawning. Watching shine There are diamonds in the sand All this morning ride Along, along these desert trails Desert trails Where the yellows, browns and crimson Desert trails Make the heart so light and winsome How your eyes they shine I reach out and touch your hand On this morning light Along, along these desert trails Some may look and find Of blood and blue But all I have to do Is softly speak your name And as with springtime rain The desert blue These desert trails Will stay where love is found us Desert trails